I have a special interest in thyroid disorder, so we're going to talk about thyroid nodules, thyroid cancer, and how we manage that today. A brief outline of what we'll talk about for the next 40 minutes or so. At the end, there'll be a chance for questions. Um, we're going to briefly talk about thyroid function abnormalities. That's not really the purpose of the talk, but I know there's a lot of questions about it, so we'll just talk about that briefly. And we'll talk a little more about thyroid nodules and cancers, focusing especially on how we look at thyroid nodules, how we evaluate those, then move into how we manage them, thyroid nodules and cancer, and throughout I'll try to highlight the way things have changed over the past year. Just by way of introduction, the thyroid gland is located low in the neck, sort of below your Adam's apple that you can feel, that's your voice box, and above your breastbone. It is critical in all our body does. The simplest way to think of it is kind of a gas pedal for our metabolism, just make sure things are at the right level. If it's working fine, we don't really notice it. Uh, this brief anatomy picture, this is without the muscles overlying or the collarbones there. I think it drives home the point that there is very rich vascular supply to the thyroid gland. It doesn't work by acting in the neck. It makes its hormone in the neck and it works everywhere else. It's sort of shaped like a butterfly as people describe it. There's talk about this a little more, the right lobe, the left lobe, and connecting them, we call that the isthmus. Again, we're going to briefly talk about thyroid function abnormalities. There is some bad information on the internet generally about a lot of things, but that's especially true of low thyroid function. Low thyroid or underactive thyroid is called hypothyroidism. Some symptoms of that could be fatigue, depression, weight gain, constipation, coarse skin or hair, feeling cold much of the time, feeling forgetful. I want you to notice that most of those symptoms are very nonspecific. Most people who feel that way don't have low thyroid function. But certainly if you feel that way, it's worth a check. Um, but most people with those symptoms don't actually have low thyroid function. The most common cause of low thyroid function is an autoimmune condition called Hashimoto's disease or autoimmune thyroiditis. Unfortunately, sometimes we're sort of told this magic. All we need to do is take thyroid hormone. We're going to feel entirely new. We're going to lose a bunch of weight of energy. The bottom line is, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. There is rare exceptions to that. There are some people with very profound low thyroid function that when they're treated they feel a lot different. That's the exception rather than the rule. Contrast that to hyperthyroidism or an overactive thyroid. These people may fear, feel irritable or nervous. They may have panic attacks or anxiety, some muscle tremor or weakness, weight loss, infrequent menstrual periods or diarrhea, sleep disturbances, feeling too warm all the time. Again, there are several types of this. It's a little less common than an underactive thyroid. There's a subtype called Graves' disease. Some of you may sort of associate this picture with hyperthyroidism, the bulging eyes. And Graves' disease is, again, an autoimmune condition that gives you hyperthyroidism. That causes some swelling and inflammation of the muscles that move your eyes. So sometimes you sort of do have that bulging appearance look. So how do we test for thyroid function? Well, thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, is a lab that all of us have had, whether we knew it or not. Um, it's a hormone produced by the pituitary gland, and as the name suggests, it causes your thyroid to be more or less active. It moves inversely with our thyroid function. So if you have an overactive thyroid, that would be reflected by your TSH being suppressed, being very low, because your pituitary gland is sort of telling your thyroid to relax. If your thyroid is underactive, that TSH would be elevated. We do check that in all patients with thyroid nodules. I'll tell you why in just a second. T3 and T4 is the abbreviation for the hormones that's made by the thyroid. The vast majority of hormone in our blood is T4. Um, the brand name of that is, uh, is Synthroid or Levothyroxine is a synthetic form of that. Um, that's what most of the hormone in our body is. Our body actually uses T3 and our body converts that T4 into T3. Sometimes we check those. TSH is a great test for thyroid function. Gives you a good picture of how your thyroid's been acting over the past month or so. It is almost always the only test needed. Certainly if it's abnormal, then it makes sense to check the hormone levels. If it's abnormal, there are some other tests you can do to try to figure out why it's abnormal. It's typically the only test we need.
And although thyroid function abnormalities are relatively common, there's no connection between those and thyroid cancer. It's not a sign of thyroid cancer. It's not a risk factor for thyroid cancer. There is a rare connection between thyroid function abnormalities and thyroid nodules. And that's why we check TSH when people have thyroid nodules, but not thyroid cancer. That's all we're going to say about thyroid function. So thyroid nodules, thyroid nodule is just a identifiable mass in the thyroid gland. They are very common. About 5% of adults have thyroid nodules that their doctor can feel, but over half of adults have thyroid nodules if we look for them. That's an important take home point. I think if you hear from your doctor that you have a thyroid nodule, you assume there must be something wrong and that it's dangerous, uh, but they're very common and most are not dangerous. Thyroid cancer is also relatively common. Uh, over 1% of us will be identified with thyroid can will be diagnosed with thyroid cancer at some point. It is more common in women. It's by now the fourth most common cancer in women and expected over the next 10 years to become the third most common cancer in women. And it's becoming much more common. Just by example, from 1975 to 2009, now three times more common than it was then. So we wonder why. Natural question. There's some controversy here. Certainly part of it is that we find a lot more thyroid cancers. Um, a lot more people have CAT scans of their chest or spine MRIs or carotid ultrasounds, and we find nodules. And some of those are thyroid cancers. And it's true, we find a lot more small early thyroid cancers. If that was it, though, we would expect the proportion of people dying from thyroid cancer to be much lower. If that was true, um, that's, that's what we'd expect, that less and less proportionally would be dying of thyroid cancer, but that's not what we see. In fact, we see a lot more early thyroid cancers, but more and more advanced thyroid cancers as well. So it's a real thing. The bottom line is we don't really know why that is. There's some regional areas where there's more thyroid cancer, thought to be related to environmental exposure, although we don't know what that is. Certainly around things like the Chernobyl disaster, over 100-fold increased risk of thyroid cancer. Thought, you know, that it could be having to do with increased medical imaging, x-rays or CAT scans, but we haven't proved that, but it seems feasible. The bottom line is we don't know why. There are four main types of thyroid cancer. By far the most is papillary thyroid cancer, followed by follicular thyroid cancer. And essentially everything we'll talk about from now on is about these two. Those two together we call well-differentiated thyroid cancer. Medullary thyroid cancer, much less common, sometimes part of a genetic condition. Anaplastic cancer, thankfully very rare and very severe. But most of what we're talking about is those first two, papillary thyroid cancer and follicular thyroid cancer. You can have symptoms of thyroid cancer. If you have a firm, rapidly growing mass that doesn't move compared to surrounding tissue, that's very concerning. If you have dramatic change in your voice and a vocal cord that isn't moving, if you're coughing up blood, there's big lymph nodes nearby, those are all ominous symptoms. But most people feel fine. They truly do. They may feel that there's a bump there, but otherwise they don't feel anything. A symptom we see all the time in the office is people feeling like there's a lump in their throat or they feel something when they swallow. That's a very common symptom, usually caused by some chronic throat irritation or voice box irritation either related to drainage from the nose, acid reflux, it is not at all a common symptom of thyroid cancer. There are some risk factors of thyroid cancer. We know that radiation exposure increases your risk of thyroid cancer. Having a first degree family member with thyroid cancer increases your risk. Those are kind of the only well-defined risk factors. When radiation was first used medically, it was quite popular and we used it for all sorts of things. People would have radiation for swollen glands or acne or colic in babies. We have thankfully gotten away from that, but people who had that as children certainly are at increased risk. More commonly now we'd see it therapeutic radiation for cancers. Childhood cancer especially increases your risk. Most people with thyroid cancer don't have identified risk factors. This is the 10,000 foot view of how we manage thyroid cancer. We're going to get into the details in a bit. The primary treatment is taking out the cancer. All other treatment can only be performed if the thyroid cancer has come out first. 
The exact extent of surgery is determined by the disease, and we'll talk about that more. An internal type radiation is sometimes used. What that is, it's a radioactive form of iodine. Thyroid cells and most thyroid cancers concentrate iodine, and so we can use the radioactive form to our advantage. It's concentrated by the thyroid cancer and then kills those cells. Sort of a conventional radiation where you'd go to get radiotherapy five days a week for a few weeks, or conventional chemotherapy is really quite unusual. It's sometimes used for really advanced tumors. Uh, there are newer chemotherapy agents that are used uh, for some advanced tumors, but most of it is surgery and radioactive iodine as needed. And there's generally an excellent prognosis. This is another important take-home point. Of those people with thyroid cancer, less than 5% of them will die of thyroid cancer. That does force us to temper how aggressively we treat thyroid cancer, understanding that most of the time it will not kill that patient. Um, I would think of it for most people as something that has to be managed but not something that's going to prove to be life-threatening. Of course, there are exceptions to that. So we're going to take a historic look at how we have evaluated thyroid nodules over the years. I think some of these strategies may seem familiar to some people in the room who've maybe been through this themselves or had family members who've been through this. But the bottom line is things have become much more complicated and in a good way. This is how things used to be. We felt the thyroid nodule and we took it out. And that meant a lot of people had surgery who didn't have thyroid cancer, but it was simple. And it meant a lot of people had thyroid surgery. Then we started using ultrasound. Medical ultrasound first sort of started in the 70s. You had to be in a water bath. It wasn't really convenient at all. But over the subsequent decades, we've started using this. And so we said, well, you have a thyroid nodule. Let's make sure you have a thyroid nodule. Let's find the thyroid nodule and then maybe take it out. A test that some of you may have heard of is a thyroid scan or a radioiodine uptake and scan. I used to do those all the time. There were some very low risk patterns on radioiodine scan. And if you had that pattern, then we could avoid surgery. But most of the time you didn't have that pattern. So still most people, we saw a nodule, we took it out. Again, relatively simple. The radioiodine is the same radioactive iodine that you'd have to treat cancer with just much, much lower doses. So how do we do ultrasound? That's now an important part of evaluating thyroid nodules. It's recommended for all patients with known or suspected thyroid nodules. The thyroid itself should be evaluated as well as the lymph nodes around the thyroid. It answers a lot of important questions. It tells us if there's a nodule or not. It tells us how big the nodule is. It tells us what that nodule looks like. And it gives us information about the nearby lymph nodes. It has a lot of benefits. It's cheap, it's painless, it's widely available, no complications from it, and it gives us the best information. So there are more expensive tests, CAT scans, radioiodine scans, MRI, and none of them are as good for thyroid nodules. So a lot of times we find thyroid nodules on things like CAT scans and then we evaluate them with ultrasound, which gives us much better detail. This is practically how it's performed. You have an ultrasound probe, over the neck with gel and based on how much of the sound energy comes back and how long it takes to get back then the computer generates a picture for us. I'm going to walk you through this just a little bit because we're going to look at a few more ultrasounds but on this kind of picture and on all the ultrasounds imagine that you are lying down your head is away from here and your feet are coming out and we're going up and down over the neck. Here's the trachea windpipe this is the right-sided carotid artery, the left-sided carotid artery. These black things are muscles that overlie the thyroid gland, and this is the thyroid. A normal thyroid is homogenous. It typically looks brighter than the surrounding muscles, but these are the big landmarks. This is a normal thyroid. There's no masses. There's no lumps or bumps in there. It's a little big because it's extending over the carotids. It otherwise looks pretty normal. Contrast that with this. This is a more typical look where we're really just looking at the right side of the thyroid gland. Here is the trachea, the right carotid artery, muscles overlying the thyroid, the thyroid, and a well-defined thyroid nodule. That's what we're looking for. So now that we started using ultrasound regularly, we said, well, how great would it be if we knew what it was 
before we decide to do surgery. Maybe we wouldn't have to do as much surgery. So that's when biopsy started becoming more common in the 80s and now picking up steam over the subsequent decades. And that can give us a couple answers. We can find out that it's thyroid cancer. We can find out that it is not cancer. And unfortunately, sometimes we can't really tell. About 5% of the time, we don't get an answer, period, which is very frustrating. It's frustrating for everyone, but it's even more frustrating for patients who had needles in their neck and then we don't have an answer. Generally recommended to repeat it, but this is also frustrating. About 20% of biopsies, even today, with the best biopsy techniques, the best cytology techniques, still end up in that indeterminate group. The challenges here are those cells don't look entirely normal, but not abnormal enough to be called thyroid cancer. Or it's not the type of cells we normally see in the thyroid gland. We talked about those types of thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer, follicular thyroid cancer. Most papillary thyroid cancers are relatively easy to call cancer on needle biopsy. Follicular thyroid cancer is much more difficult. What defines cancer is not the cells, but the way they behave, if they're invading into surrounding structures. And so oftentimes we're gonna be stuck here. So now that we have this, how do we know when we're gonna biopsy it? We can do an ultrasound and see it. How are we gonna decide if we're gonna biopsy it? Again, used to be very, very simple. Everything over a centimeter, about half an inch, we biopsy. We're doing that less now, and the current guidelines would say the size still does matter, but the appearance of the, on the ultrasound matters a whole lot more. And I think this is facilitated by better ultrasound. Most thyroid nodules do not require biopsy. They're either too small or look very reassuring on ultrasound. So they need to be evaluated, but most don't end up need to be biopsy. I'm gonna show you practically what this means, how that looks. We're gonna do that by showing some ultrasounds here. So again, this is a left thyroid nodule. This is the trachea, left carotid artery, muscles overlying the thyroid. This is all the thyroid, and there's a large nodule. Okay, must be an inch and a half, two inches. That's not thyroid cancer. That's a fluid-filled cyst. We don't need to biopsy that to prove if it's thyroid cancer or not. So we don't. Contrast that to this. This is still a big nodule in about the same place, but it looks very different. This is actually a very low suspicion nodule. This looks like a sponge. We'd call that a spongiform nodule. This is not papillary thyroid cancer, but it could be one of the more unusual types. So we'd still biopsy these, but only if it's quite big. So two centimeters or so is when we'd biopsy those. This might be harder to orient yourself. This is the carotid artery on the right side. That's the trachea. This is a much larger nodule. Aside from the size though, it has a fluid filled component, but it's mostly solid. So it's a higher risk nodule. It's about 10% risk. So these, now we'd biopsy if they're a little smaller, about one and a half centimeters. This can be how that follicular thyroid cancer can look. Versus this, this is another right-sided nodule. Right carotid artery, trachea, thyroid, and that nodule. It's a little higher suspicion, about 20% risk because it is solid because it's darker than the surrounding thyroid. This looks a bit like papillary thyroid cancer. That's why we would biopsy those now if they're anything bigger than a centimeter. There are some ultrasound features that are extremely concerning for thyroid cancer. If it's solid and darker than surrounding thyroid and has microcalcifications is what this is showing, or there are certain growth patterns, if it's invading into the surrounding muscle, there's large lymph nodes nearby. That's highly predictive of thyroid cancer. And so we'd biopsy those if they're pretty small. Some of you may wonder, well, if you think it's thyroid cancer, why wouldn't you biopsy if it's five millimeters? You know, why wait for it to be a centimeter? It's based on a couple things. First, we know from autopsy studies that a lot of people who die of unrelated conditions die with thyroid cancers, up to 20% or even more. People who die have small thyroid cancers. And they didn't hurt them. They were there and didn't hurt them. So that's why we hesitate to biopsy things when they're very, very small. We also know from some countries, Korea and Japan especially, have done a lot of screening ultrasounds, which is not recommended here, but just screening ultrasounds. And so they find a lot of small nodules, and for a while we're very enthusiastic about biopsying a lot of nodules. So they found a lot of small thyroid cancers. 
And for many of them, they decide to do nothing. Just watch them. Keep doing ultrasounds, see if anything changes. And they learned that for a large proportion of those patients, nothing did change over a long time. And so they didn't necessarily have to take them out. Because of that, that's why we tend to wait for it to be about half an inch before we biopsy it. That's also not always true. If there's large lymph nodes associated with it, that cancer is proving that it is dangerous and it should be biopsied even if it's smaller. How is that performed? We use ultrasound almost always. That dramatically reduces the risk of falsely normal biopsies, basically because you're biopsying the normal surrounding thyroid. It's performed with thin needles, just trying to send some of the cells to the pathologist. That's the tissue they want. And it works very well. If that test says you have cancer, 95% chance you have cancer. If that test says it's not cancer, it's benign. 95% chance it's benign. It can be performed in the physician's office. I do that several times every week and sometimes performed in the hospital. We call that a FNA, fine needle aspiration biopsy. This is practically what it looks like. An ultrasound showing you where you are and a needle collecting cells. And this is what I'm looking for. Okay, this is a nodule in the left side of the thyroid, trachea, carotid artery, muscles. This is the thyroid. And there is a small nodule there. It must be a centimeter or so. So basically, you can't feel that nodule. You're being sure that you're sampling the nodule and not that surrounding thyroid. It used to be quite common to perform biopsies without ultrasound guidance. Sometimes it's still done for really large, obvious nodules. But even in those cases, there are higher and lower risk portions of nodules, so ultrasound can really help. I'd say an, a biopsy performed without ultrasound is useful if it shows cancer. If it's benign, it's not that reassuring because you don't know that you've actually sampled what you want to sample. So here's where we are so far. We think you have a thyroid nodule. We do an ultrasound to find out if you have a thyroid nodule. Based on how it looks, we decide to do a biopsy, and we can get a couple answers. It's actually a lot more complicated than this, which I'm going to show you in a second. But this is just evaluating nodule. It used to be this. You have a thyroid nodule. Let's take it out. Now this is the fleshed out form of that last slide. Okay? This is just to figure out what to do with that nodule. We haven't talked about treatment at all at this point. So it's getting a lot more complicated. That's very clear. Now let's talk about what we do. This is the historic patterns. Benign, let's do nothing. Cancer, let's take out your whole thyroid. One of those in between. Remember 20% of biopsies end up here. The risk of cancer in these is about 20%. Let's take out that half of your thyroid. Let's briefly talk about this. Most benign thyroid nodules don't need surgery. There's exceptions to that. If it's very large, if it's unsightly, if it's growing very rapidly and we're concerned even if it doesn't look like cancer on biopsy. Sometimes with certain thyroid function abnormalities, we may remove a benign thyroid. Sometimes if they get large enough, they're growing into the chest, it makes sense to remove that thyroid. If it's suspicious enough, sorry, if it's suspicious enough that we biopsy it and it proves to be benign, it's not as clear what we're supposed to do with that. Observe doesn't mean do nothing, but it means keep an eye on it. Truthfully, it matters exactly what it looked like. If it looks like a very high-risk nodule, recommendation would be to repeat that biopsy in about six months. But for most, we generally look again in a year. If it's grown significantly, generally agreed to be about 20% in two of the three dimensions, or if it's picked up new suspicious features, then we'd recommend repeat biopsy versus keeping an eye on it. What about this? I said, this is what we always did. It was one of those in between, 20% risk of thyroid cancer. So we took out that half of the thyroid gland. The secret in thyroid cancer surgery is most people who have thyroid surgery are in this group. Most people who have thyroid surgery don't have thyroid cancer. Most people with thyroid surgery, strictly speaking, don't need thyroid surgery. So the question is, does that make sense? Does that make sense? On the one hand, only 20% risk of cancer. That means most of these people don't need cancer. A lot of unnecessary surgery with risks, complications, inconvenience, a lot of cost. On the other hand, if I knew that I had something in me that a 20% chance of being cancer and possibly hurting me, I think I'd want it out. And that's why, that's what we recommended. When we knew that, we took it out. Now there's some other testing that's available. 
there's genetic testing that's available. So people who end up in this indeterminate group are trying to figure out, do you actually need surgery or not? There's a few different types of tests. This is the one that I do. Basically, we can look at the genes that that thyroid nodule is expressing. It's not a, it's not a your body genetic test. It's a genetic test of that nodule. There are certain patterns of gene expression that are extremely low risk, extremely reassuring. That goes here. It has the same risk of being cancer as if that initial biopsy said it was cancer. We can treat it just the same. And there are some people that don't have that extremely reassuring pattern. It's not to say that it's definitely thyroid cancer, but they don't have that extremely reassuring pattern. That's called suspicious. For those benign ones, we treat it just like it was benign. As the same risk, we treat it like it was benign. For those suspicious ones, we take out that half of your thyroid. The breakdown for the test I use is 50-50 here. If you're in this indeterminate group, the results are about 50-50 that you'll end up in one or the other of those. That means that here you have about a 40% chance of it being cancer. So most people in this suspicious group still don't have thyroid cancer. The upside of this is half the people avoid surgery. The downside is it's expensive, much less expensive than getting half your thyroid out, but it's expensive. And it's not perfect, 50-50. Cancer here is really 20-80, but the test is 50-50. And this is where the big advances are gonna be over the next decade, next 10, 20 years. They're developing tests that should be able to tell us benign, cancer, and stuck in between. And what I'd hope is we have a test that if it's 80-20, it'll give us something like 75 and 25. So most people can avoid surgery if they don't need it. So here we are. We talked about this. This is historic now. A lot of times we can avoid that surgery. What about this? That's what we always used to do. But I said early on, the extent of surgery is determined by the disease. That used to be what we did. We always took out the whole thyroid unless we were taking out half a thyroid and we just incidentally found a th small thyroid cancer, then sometimes we'd leave it there. But if we knew it was thyroid cancer, you'd always take out the whole thyroid. There are some genetic tests that don't tell you if it's benign or not. They tell you if it's cancer versus staying in that middle group. The downside of that is everyone still gets surgery. You do get half your, half your thyroid out or the whole thyroid out. But with more recent uh, guidelines, maybe that's not true. The advantages of this is it allows you to do radioactive iodine. You cannot do that radioactive iodine treatment if you have half your thyroid. It doesn't work. The radioactive iodine would just try to kill the other half and wouldn't treat thyroid cancer. You also can't do whole body scans, or thyroid scans very well if you have half the thyroid. It also makes it a lot simpler to follow up. Lab work is much easier to interpret if you don't have a thyroid. The disadvantage there is it increases your complications and it guarantees you will need to be on thyroid hormone. If you have half your thyroid out, little under half of those people will end up needing to be on thyroid hormone. But if you have your whole thyroid out, you will die without taking thyroid hormone. You absolutely need to be on it. And it does increase your complications. Simply put, having half your thyroid out versus the whole thyroid out means you have half the risk of complications. And it's not one out of a thousand versus two out of a thousand. It's six percent versus twelve percent. So it's not nothing. So we have learned that more limited surgery is often appropriate. We talk about cancer in terms of its tumor staging or T staging. Now T1, T2, T3, T4 based on the size and how it's acting compared to surrounding tissues. It turns out the people with early thyroid cancers can be treated very successfully by taking out that half of their thyroid gland. You have no increased risk of dying from your cancer and you avoid a lot of complications. People with large invasive thyroid cancers absolutely need their whole thyroid out they were less likely to die. They have their whole thyroid out. Those are the patients who need radioactive iodine, and that can only be performed if the whole thyroid is out. People in between with moderate-sized but not terribly invasive thyroid cancers, there are patient factors that can take you either way. Turns out most people with thyroid cancer are in these groups. Most people are in those groups. This especially is a big recent change that some of those people with a three centimeter cancer, but otherwise looking pretty well behaved. They have the same survival if you only remove that half of their thyroid. Briefly talking about what we do after surgery. 
Sometimes you do thyroid hormone. If you have your whole thyroid out, you need thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone, the more thyroid hormone you take, the lower your thyroid stimulating hormone will be. Remember, they move inverse to each other. Thyroid stimulating hormone makes your thyroid be more active. It also stimulates thyroid cancer. It makes thyroid cancers grow more. So based on how, risk, how high risk your disease is, we may want that TSH level to be quite low. So sometimes we want to give you extra thyroid hormone. Sometimes radioactive iodine, if you have an advanced tumor. We follow it with labs and ultrasound. Unfortunately, some people get dropped and they don't have any following, but this allows us to detect recurrences early on. And there's a whole host of other possible treatments we can do based on whatever outcomes or specifics of that patient. The new standard of care then, today treatment, includes less biopsies. Instead of biopsying everything over a centimeter, we're a lot more discerning in that. Less surgery. And this is where more advances are going to be made, but that's primarily doing less biopsies and genetic testing. More limited surgery for people with thyroid cancer. Less radioactive iodine treatment. Can't really talk about this today, but radioactive iodine has its own possible complications. It has risks. It does increase your lifetime risk of another cancer because it's a radiation exposure. It has side effects. It's expensive and relatively inconvenient. The bottom line is all of this is better. It's better for patients. It also means it's a lot more complicated. <laughs> okay, let's talk about that. The American Thyroid Association is an organization with thyroid surgeons and endocrinologists and oncologists and radiation oncologists and radiologists. And they get together and review the evidence and publish guidelines about how to manage thyroid nodules or thyroid cancers. And they've made a couple goes at this. The first one is 96. We've gotten more information. And the flow charts have become more complicated. So it's become a more complicated document. And it's now ballooned to well over 100 pages. That more individualized care about this is good. It means less complications. It means less inconvenience. It means less cost for patients. The downside is this is harder for your doctors. If your doctor spends 1% or 2% of his or her time taking care of thyroid patients, it's probably not that realistic that they would know all that. It's just not that realistic. That means there's a lot of people today who have thyroid ultrasounds that talk about the size of the nodules, and that's it, not how they look. That means there's a lot of people, even with a history of thyroid cancer, no one looks at the lymph nodes in their neck. There's a lot of people who have biopsies that they probably don't need or don't have biopsies on pretty high suspicion nodules. Uh, it means that a lot of people aren't offered genetic testing before they have surgery. And it means a lot of people with early thyroid cancer have their whole thyroid out because it's more complicated. That's the downside of the more individualized care. Here are some take-home points. Thyroid nodules are extremely common. Having a thyroid nodule in and of itself is not dangerous. doesn't mean there's anything wrong. It just means you have a little bump in your thyroid. They do require evaluation with ultrasound and some simple labs. Most thyroid nodules don't require biopsies. Most thyroid nodules do not require surgeries. Thyroid cancer treatment is becoming much more individualized, more conservative. And being up to date on guidelines and current evidence is important to get the best outcomes while minimizing complication. Here are some resources for you. The American Thyroid Association, they disseminate evidence-based guidelines for me and other clinicians at thyroid.org. And you can read those guidelines. There's also more patient-oriented things. There's also guidelines about how to manage hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism, thyroid disease and pregnancy and children and every other thing you could imagine. Uh, excellent patient-oriented website is this Light of Life Foundation. It's evidence-based but is really geared towards patients and gives a lot of good information. I'd encourage you to check out either of those websites. And that's all I have and I'd be very happy to take any questions you have now.